What are you waiting for? Christmas? We've danced around the Duke long enough, doing a pro series on the Holy Trinity in a weird order that no sane person would do. Shadow Warrior first? Who does Shadow Warrior first? Duke Nukem is a much bigger topic. There's so much more you guys gotta understand. How did this man get testosterone poisoning? How did he earn his balls of steel? Why was his franchise so venerated that people would wait 14 fucking years for a proper new installment? We need to start at the beginning, when Duke Nukem was a nobody. Just another hero and an Apogee platformer. He could have been just another Milo, or Snake Logan, or Major Strong. Striker, who the fuck is Major Striker? Uh, okay. We're talking about Duke Nukum. As he was named after Apogee found out about this guy, this guy from Captain Planet named My name is Duke Nukum! I'm a nuclear shark! I'm hotter than Elvis! And I glow in the dark! They changed it to avoid a lawsuit, but it wasn't a registered name, so it seems stupid in retrospect, since who the fuck thinks about this spunk pincher when you say Duke Nukem? No one. But in 1991, this was widely accepted among Captain Planet fans? Who is Duke Nukem? He's a bad dude, served in the army, he was such a total badass that when evil scientist Dr. Proton created an army of tech bots to destroy mankind, the CIA called him to take care of it all on his own. Duke Nukem 1 is primitive. It's jumping and shooting and PC speaker noises. Oh god! It's all we had back then. Listen to his walk, listen! Listen to his- I didn't care, I was like three years old when this game came out. Duke used to look a little different, you know, you can see the purple in there. This is what he looks like on the box for Duke Nukem- Oh my god! It looks like Rob Liefeld drew the end of Akira, and also some of my nightmares. That is not what arms are supposed to look like. Get that shit away from me. How about some story? We got a story, I don't know what you're talking about. So you're the pitiful hero they sent to stop me. I, Dr. Proton, will soon rule the world. You're wrong, Proton Br- <laughs> Stupid fucking name, okay. I'll be done with you and still have time to watch Oprah. Duke is actually a sensitive man. He loves guns, babes, and Oprah. You don't see many babes in this game. Or any babes. Or Oprah. And you only see one gun that can be upgraded to fire up to five blasts on screen at once. So it's June 1991 and Duke Nukem comes out with an engine programmed by Todd Replogel. With, of course, help from sentient galaxy brain meme John Carmack. I would really like to stop talking about John Carmack. I think these jokes are a net negative on the show. Replogle is also credited as a designer along with Scott Miller and Alan Blum. Two names that are going to show up a lot in the future. Our old friend Jim Norwood is credited as an artist along with George Broussard. Man, these were the good old days where a few guys could get together and make a game. And episodic gaming actually worked. I give a lot of credit to id Software on this channel. But Apogee? They were there too, and Duke Nukem is way better than Commander Keen. And you know what? Blake Stone is better than Wolfenstein 3D. So Duke Nukem fights through a robot army on Earth in Shrapnel City. Remember that name for later. Then on the moon in the second episode, that's also oddly familiar. And then Dr. Proton escapes to the future because Duke Nukem kicked his ass so hard that he needed to go into temporal witness protection. Look at the backgrounds in these levels. These are proof that Proton couldn't handle his world-destroying shit in the present, so he went to the future to escape Duke Nukem, who just followed him. It's like a reverse Terminator timeline. Duke kills him, takes his time machine back to the present future of 1997, and is now Earth's mightiest hero. So Duke Nukem sold like 60 or 70,000 copies, pretty good for the early PC market. So you gotta make a sequel to this quaint DOS platformer. Where do you go from there? I am back. Duke Nukem 2. Get wrecked. Go big or go home. You thought Duke Nukem was a badass. Get a load of Duke Nukem 2. This game kicks ass. You're running around, everything's exploding, you got fucking lasers and rockets and a flamethrower that you can fly with, aliens and terminators and earthquakes, and Bobby Prince almost plagiarizing Megadeth. But just look at this. Holy fuck, this is awesome. 
You can pick up a copy of these bona fide classic games on Steam for... No, you can't. Thanks, Randy, you barely legal squirty magic trick on a USB drive and medieval times profiteer off the backs of hardworking game devs not noticing 10 grand off your credit card, lion, low rent, party magician, pendulette, filleting, backstabbing, mall narc, and Sega cheating. Greasy bastard. I love a good joke. I mean, for fuck's sake, I own the Duke Nukem franchise. I hope Gabe eats your soul for your treachery. Duke Nukem 2 starts with the Duke going missing when aliens kidnap him from the set of an interview where he's plugging his book, Why I'm So Great. The Rigelidans write, they want to steal his brain and plug it into their war computer because Duke Nukem's brain would single-handedly win a war against humanity. Bazinga! Sure. He gets tossed in a cell, but he has an exploding molar in his mouth, blows the door open, grabs a gun, and just starts wrecking shit. Duke Nukem 2, in terms of side scroll and action gaming on the PC, I think is unmatched. It's so big, so explosive, so over the top and insane with all this shit flying around. God damn it, it's a rush. Not fast enough? Turn the game speed up. That's a thing you can do. So of course, Duke Nukem crushes the alien menace, jumps into a ship, and returns to Earth. And our feature presentation, Duke Nukem 3D, takes place directly after this. A babe, a stogie, and a bottle of Jack. That's what I need right now. And no more freaking aliens. Just then, a white-hot plasmatic blast punched through the hull of his cruiser. Klaxons flared, warning lights flashed, and static filled his monitors. He flipped on his comm. Hey, anybody out there? I got a little problem. Mayday, mayday, the radio replied. Los Angeles is under attack. There are aliens everywhere. And they've mutated the LAPD. Is anyone there? We need help. Great. What's the problem with all these aliens attacking Earth anyway? How many alien races have to get their asses kicked? I guess one more. Grr, arr, I'm gonna get medieval on your asses. Tonight. Right then, you're dropped into Hollywood Holocaust and straight into one of the greatest and most legendary action games ever created. Shadow Warrior was a little more advanced, Blood was on the whole a better experience, but both those games had to stand on the shoulders of Duke Nukem 3D to be as good as they were. It's finally time to pro this shit. Time to kick ass and shoot bubblegum at the same time. For this playthrough, we're gonna be using the Duke Nukem 3D 20th Anniversary World Tour. Nah, I'm kidding, we're using E Duke. Fuck off, Randy. Before Duke became a punchline, before Duke Nukem Forever was vaporware, Duke was king of the world. And this game is why. We'd never seen anything like this before. We weren't prepared. You were Schwarzenegger. You were Stallone. You were the baddest motherfucker alive. We're playing on Come Get Some. Not Damn I'm Good, fuck playing on Damn I'm Good, because it's just Come Get Some, except you have to blow up enemy corpses to make sure they don't come back. And that's not fun, that's bullshit and a joke, and we're here to have fun, right? Piece of cake. It's why I didn't play Doom on Nightmare or Blood on Extra Crispy. Hollywood Holocaust tells you everything you need to know about Duke Nukem 3D's gameplay in one concise, badass, explosive level. First thing you do, I mean, you don't have to shoot these explosive barrels first, but it's good to know how those work. Explosions, the screen shakes, you jump down through the vent, and you're in the streets. Within a minute, you've killed aliens, you've picked up a secret rocket launcher, you get a rocket launcher in this game before you get a shotgun. You get steroids, which I don't really use because honestly they make the player go too fast in my opinion. But they're there, you can use them, good for speedrunners. <laughs> Let me just turn on the crosshair. For this precise shot to blow a hole into this wall, create another entrance into this building instead of going in the rookie way through the theater exit. Ha! Bullshit. Go home, casuals. This game may have been 2.5D, but we couldn't tell. There's tricks in the build engine to make it seem like you occupy actual 3D space. Teleports on spiral staircases and elevators, all that jazz. First aliens you meet are the disposable assault troopers, who are easily picked off with four or five well-placed pistol shots. The pistol in this game has the fire rate of a submachine gun in other games, reloads every 12 shots, and is the only reloading weapon in the game, which, yeah, okay, whatever. The assault troopers fly around and shoot energy beams at you, and when they're killed they drop pistol ammo for some reason, I never got that. Assault captains are slightly stronger and can teleport around, leading to what is probably the best feeling in this entire game, which is shooting one, killing it, having it teleport away, and then it comes back and dies.
pig cops are the aforementioned mutated LAPD officers now emblazoned with LARD. Get it? Listen, I got nothing against the fucking pigs. I was lucky enough to pick up a shotgun from the pig cop early on. Here's the pig cop dance. Shoot him. Duck behind cover to avoid his absolutely devastating shotgun blast. Nail him twice. Maybe get a little ammo or some armor out of it. Aside from them, there are gun turrets, which are annoying. I usually just fire a rocket in their direction and let the splash damage do the rest. Entering this shockingly high-class porno theater. Yeah, it's a porno theater because Duke Nukem 3D is... Well, it's a little seedy. It's kind of fun. It's not weird like in later Duke games, because while you're not directly saving the babes like in Manhattan Project... All yours, Duke. Sorry, honey. I got some ass-kicking to do first. Don't shoot them. Don't do it. They tell you to... Kill me. Which is weird, and the implications are... Not good, but don't kill them. I accidentally killed one later, and what happens is that if you do that, more enemies teleport in to kill you. So to be fair to Duke Nukem, the game outright punishes you for violence against women. So 3D Realms, formerly Apogee, 3D Realms, reality is our game. Well, it's not exactly realistic. That's not to say that the level interactivity in Duke Nukem 3D wasn't revolutionary. Even if early on doors would fucking kill you. This sucks. This did happen in earlier versions of Duke 3D, but to simulate it, I just used Megaton Edition. It took me longer to find one in the 1.3 version than I got off the CD from 1996. Oh, fucking roll. Blow holes in walls, activate secret switches. See this cash register at the concession stand? It opens a secret with armor. It doesn't open and give you money. You don't need money. Duke Nukem has an endless supply of cash for strippers. Here's one you're probably more familiar with. Don't have time to play with myself. Get yourself a holoduke to distract enemies. Another thing I barely use, and in fact I only use it when I press H instead of J on the keyboard for the jetpack. Ah yes, the jetpack. We'll get to how that breaks the game more in episode 2. But for now, use that jetpack to go to the highest point of the level near the exit, blast the turrets, get yourself a full jetpack again. Save it by jumping down, and at the last second activate it to not die and save fuel. There's a secret where you can get all of Episode 1's weapons in this apartment. Now remember, this is 1996, and being able to describe anything in a first-person shooter as something that could possibly resemble something in real life. Apartments, movie theaters, strip clubs. nuh -uh, No way. Go back and look at the city levels in Doom 2, or better yet, go look at the city levels in Tech War. This was completely new. You could hit light switches, you could use toilets, you could drink water from broken toilets and fire hydrants for health, you could crawl through vents to bypass the main route in the level. Seemed like the possibilities were endless. Blow up this entire arcade. And this is probably the player's first exposure to blowing a giant hole in the level that leads to an earlier area. Opening the map up just a little bit more. It's just incomprehensible how much of a step up this was. Quake went full 3D and Duke went full interactive. I'm gonna say that both are equally responsible for paving the way for Half-Life. Can I just mention that nearly every time Duke Nukem leaves a level, he blows the fucker up? Let's rock. So that level was totally badass. How can you top that? Yeah, that works. When your first level has a porn theater, you gotta go for a pornographic bookstore next, right? And then a strip club? You might not remember these things. These were bookstores. They used to sell books, which we used to get from trees and human skin in certain circumstances. It's not important. You'll get introduced to the recon patrol vehicles. You can rocket them if they get close enough and stop to shoot you, otherwise I just hit them with a few shotgun blasts. The pig cop survives this. Knowing these levels well enough can turn you into a stone-cold murder machine. There's probably something around that corner, and since hit scanners in this game aren't nearly as evil as the ones in Shadow Warrior or Blood, until later, you usually have a decent window to kill them. Sometimes the pig cops are crouched and waiting for you just to come right into view. Ugh, that's no good. A pipe bomb can usually take care of them if it's close enough. Out of pipe bombs? That's okay. This store carries them, just in a secret behind a bookshelf. And in one of those private rooms, there's a rocket launcher. Why not? 
Don't save your rockets. Don't save them. Use them all. Especially when you get into the bar and these fucking pig cops try to ambush you. Kill them. Then greet this fine lady of the night. I assume she's a prostitute, otherwise Duke has handed money over to some random woman in a bar. If she's not a prostitute, that only works sometimes. You wanna dance? Shake it, baby. Shake it, baby. Shake it, baby. God, that's greasy. There's a secret in the bathroom with all this neat stuff in it, and also the octobrain. They make awful, awful noises when you shoot them, as if they actually are psychically torturing you with their own pain. Rockets are great for them, because then they only make this sound. When you get a Devastator in the next episode, it's even better, trust me. Their attacks do a ton of damage, but can be easily avoided and disintegrate after a certain range. By now, you'll have your Chain Gun Cannon, another fine weapon that kicks ass. Sometimes it's called the Ripper. The pickup message calls it the Chain Gun Cannon, but in the manual, it's called the Ripper. Not the best for larger enemies, cuts down smaller ones with three barrels of belt-fed destruction. <laughs> Not to downplay the shotgun, it's fine, decently powerful, a little bland for the time, satisfying to use, nowhere near the buckshot perfection of Doom 2's Super Shotgun or Blood Shotgun or Shadow Warrior's Riot Gun. It's good though, it does the job. Game like Blood or Shadow Warrior is closer to a John Woo action movie, whereas Duke Nukem is more like Commando. You're a walking slab of meat with enormous weapons. Kill them all, they're stealing our chicks! Duke's <clears throat> character is another thing you didn't see a lot of in FPS games. He talked, albeit in shit 8-bit samples of John St. John gritting his teeth and doing a deeper Dirty Harry impression, stealing one-liners from Evil Dead, Aliens, and Duke's closest physical analog, Roddy Piper from They Live, sunglasses and all. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Don't take that as a knock against John St. John. He seems like a nice man and he does good work. Duke's sunglasses don't reveal secret messages, though. You need the night vision goggles for that. So I'm using up all my rockets because I'm about to lose them. At the end of the second map, the aliens capture you behind masked textures, which might as well be walls made of diamonds. Now on death row, Duke makes no escape attempts before being put into the electric chair. That's fair, you gotta kick a pig cop to death. There's another on the way, grab a pistol and waste him. Hit this button on the left first. Movie. Kill everything. Grab another med kit and holoduke. I wasted too much ammo here. Whatever. The chapel is full of aliens and a dead monk from Rise of the Triad. Armor, health, secrets everywhere. Behind the unholy stained glass, there's an octobrain, and of course... That's one Doom Space Marine. Who wants some? In a lesser game, this would be arrogance. But this game blew Doom out of the water in 96. Later on in the game, you'll be able to pick up laser trip bombs. For now, you have to settle for blowing them up with pipe bombs. I don't use them anyway. I prefer a more direct approach. I just want to explain the progression of this level just to demonstrate how insane all of this sounds. Not only compared to a Doom level, but compared to the progression of a modern shooter level. You start off in an electric chair. You break out of death row. You grab your guns. You dodge an elaborate laser trap. Escape through a tunnel in one of the cells. Blow up cave walls to get into the sewer. Hijack a submarine. Exit the level. All of that is awesome. And Duke Nukem 3D is full of levels like this. Now that the game is really kicked into gear, each level transitions into the next one smoothly. In Toxic Dump, you start off in the sub. When you leave Toxic Dump to go to the secret level, Launch Facility, that's not quite right, but when you leave Launch Facility, it's just as smooth a transition to the Abyss with this runoff tunnel here. Technically not a sewer, just Toxic Waste Runoff. This one is... Okay, it introduces more crazy shit no one had ever thought to do in an FPS game before, not even including a crane that picks you up. You get shrunk to travel through small spaces, another thing you'll be able to do to the enemies later in Episode 2. Don't get caught in the small space afterwards, because the build engine will just kill you. You'll get the shrink ray in the next episode, but not a laser gun like the shareware version promises, that's a fucking lie. So then you're in the water, rocketing octobrains, dodging underwater mines, blowing holes in the wall to find the secret level. 
Find it, it's cool, it's fun. Mostly for this. The Abyss, for the most part, is the weakest level in the first episode. It's a little awkward. Sorry, level lord. It's not a bad level, it just gets marred down in caves and octobrains and weird puzzles, and you can skip huge parts of it with the jetpack. Going through where you have to hit this switch, and then you stand here to make this huge explosion happen and get shrunk. I like the secrets here, honestly, like this one. I don't know what's happening here, but it's cool. Holy shit. You'll be running low on jetpack fuel by the end of this level if you're going through and finding the secrets. Which is too bad, because you need it for this cool shit right here. This is a crashed alien spaceship where your first boss battle takes place. There's a beautiful, otherworldly design with the lighting and the textures and the layout of the ship. Groovy. The Battle Lord Episode 1's boss is the hardest in the game, because he fucking hit scans. If you're lucky, he spams you with these grenades. Otherwise, it's a giant chain gun. And you see how much damage he's doing. I have to use the med kit in the middle. This is still way easier than Blood or Shadow Warrior. So easy, in fact, that this is gonna be a Zero Death Episode 1 run. and I'm coming to get the rest of you alien bastards. And he is, because they're after the women. Pretty dark and fucked up, but it's not like in DNF where they actually show it. No, that's... But wait, Sivvy, what about Faces of Death? If I'm gonna talk about episode one, I have to talk about the super secret warp only until world tour. Hard-ass ball-breaking map, Faces of Death. I didn't forget about this one either. There's a way to access it from the Abyss if you cheat, and then go through Launch Facility again, and then go through the Abyss again. We're not doing that, I'm just gonna warp. It's got all the Deb's faces on it, see the, the faces. Oh, hello Randy. Originally just a deathmatch level, there's all these mini battle lords in it, and it's much, much harder than probably any other level in the game. Luckily there's a few things to help you out. Armor and health on the center platform access to all the weapons, and if you get Battle Lords in the right spot, you can send rockets through the teleporters at them. Die, you son of a bitch. I ended up weakening most of the Battle Lords and then just shrinking them. There's no exit to this level, so that's the end. Next stop... The final frontier. Nobody steals our chicks and lives.